Sunday, April 18th, 2021. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. And welcome to Comes Out Alive, the Bear Podcast, of episode number 598. Oh, boy. And uh, we have Edward Angelini Cook back with us. Woo-hoo! Sorry. Yay. Uh, sorry, I'm a little flabbergasted. We are two episodes away from our 600th uh, numbered episode. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's why I'm like, oh, boy. It's okay. We just have another 402 to go. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, what? Uh... Math. Got it. Anyways. For... A thousand. A thousand. We're we're going to have that. We're going to have that like Y2K glitch because I I specifically set it up for a three digit number. Like the first episode of Cubs Out Loud was COL001. Okay. So there we go. We have a definitive end. 999 kids. That's it. Like (laughs) everything else is going to break. Not going to work. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to just have to add on another digit. <laughs> or, or I'm going to have to drop off a, a letter. So instead of comes out loud, it'll be comes out. <laughs> 1,000. No, it's okay. Because that's another 7.7 7 years away. <laughs> Gary just did that quick math in his head. Um... <laughs> hey, because I was like, how long would that take? Oh, yeah. So roughly, it would be another eight years of doing this before we even cross that threshold. So um, I'm not uh, really concerned at the moment. <laughs> a thousand. So anyway, we, have a, we have a guest. <laughs> Hi. Gary, Garris, tell us why Edward Angelini Cook is back. Well, Ed's back because we love him. Duh. Me too. Oh. <laughs> so. Guys. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to, you know, have a, a returning guest, uh, you know, to interact with and have fun with, you know, why not make it someone who's our resident sex therapist, you know? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> and we've been doing um, the Landscape of Relationships as a while as a series, and uh, we did a few episodes last year, and we're doing some more this year. And uh, last month we did the discussion of trust. Um, but the discussion got to be uh, enough in detail that we decided to split it out. So we have a part one, and now we have part two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Ed's back to talk with us about uh, the concept of trust and relationships. When we had left off, we were discussing um, Brene Brown's The Seven Elements of Trust. Uh, it's an acronym mm-hmm. breathing. So we had discussed boundaries, reliability, accountability. Um, We got into talking about the vault and integrity, Um, and then we were going to continue on from there. But, uh, Ed, do you want to kind of do a a little bit more in-depth recap on those items as we get into this discussion? Yeah, um, definitely. So did we we actually talk about the vault and integrity yet? I don't don't think so. I I think, yeah, I think today we're talking about Bing. (laughs) V-I-N-G. <laughs> so the reason I said it that way is I went back and listened to the end of <clears throat> the previous podcast because uh, it had been a while and my other two co-hosts were busy zinging about the acronym and having fun with that and so uh, the way that, where I picked it up at they were talking about Vault and Integrity and they didn't go on to the other two so that's why I said it that way so uh, but you probably have a better memory than I. I I, I think the I think the did. the punning was was the the was dying out. It was like this joke is gone. Right. I mean, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what we talked about last time was about um uh you know like so. We have an entire other landscape of relationships um, episode on boundaries, but basically um, the concept is, you know, you respect my boundaries, I respect yours, and 
when you're not clear about what's okay or not okay, that you're going to ask and I'm going to ask okay, and that there's both this willingness um, that we can say no. Um, the as far as reliability goes, this is um, just about you know what you're gonna you are going to do what you say that you're going to do. Um, you know I can you know always you know I can call um, on you and you can say that you're going to do something and I know without a doubt that you're going to do that. And then accountability is just the idea that. Um, if you mess up, right, which we are all prone to do, we're not perfect, that you are going to own your mistakes, you're going to apologize, and you're going to make amends, um, mm -hmm. which I remember we said we can have an entire other um, episode on forgiveness and amends. Um, yeah. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, also, but like all of this kind of goes along with us too, that like, you know, recognizing that we're not perfect, we're going to make mistakes, and if we mess up, it's uh, our responsibility to own that and to apologize and to make amends to others. True. Yeah, so that's that's br briefly what we talked about last time, but this time we're going to talk about, like what Gary talked about, the vault, integrity, non-judgment, and generosity. Um And like the vault, I think, is really interesting. Um And I don't, yeah. I don't know if if you guys um, had a, a re-listen to the the pod to that to that uh, the that video, mm -hmm. but I think the vault is something that within our community we <laughs> don't really do well. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh huh. Uh, uh -huh. So sure, what Gary. that means basically is that you don't share information or experiences that are not yours to share. Um, like I need to know that my confidences are kept and that you're not sharing with me any information about other people that could be confidential or should be confidential. Uh, and the first thing that comes to my mind is steel magnolias. Oh, <laughs> if you no. don't got anything nice to say, come sit next to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect little example there. Wow. Right. Like this is this th the thing that comes to my mind is like the gossip queens, yeah. Like like people that just go around like it, it may I mean and you know what it's probably one hundred percent actual factual information that they are spreading. Like they 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 maybe they know the tea. They they they've brewed the tea. They they've poured it in the cup and they've got the tea. Um, but is it always theirs to share? And usually the answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, especially in a some form of relationship and whether that relationship is like a friendship or a a um, a actual like relationship where a, 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 a sexual of a sexual nature or is a one time uh, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am kind of um, hookup relationship like. That still, you know, for some reason, for some, there's a need to keep that information confidential. You know, um, I will, oh gosh, whew, memory just flooded in. And um, I went to a um, college LGBT conference. It was in my state, Kentucky. And um, I had a casual encounter with someone that I had met that day. <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, Gasp. yeah. I, I, I mean, I am just, you know, you uh, in a state of uh -huh. belief yeah. that you would go to a function that had the gays <laughs> and that there was hooking up. I, checks out. Gasping gay. <laughs> anyway so i went to this function i met this person and we hooked up and i will own um at the time i was more bottom than top and i was not prepared oh and things kind of happened and what i found out later is we you know we ended and then you know, i apologized and you know things happened la, da, da, and he's okay go with it what i found out is he literally went upstairs to like there was a general like hospitality kind of suite and told 
like everybody. <laughs> like, and um, I didn't find this out until after the conference was over and I was back at college and I am having an argument um, with someone like who was mm-hmm. also there and um, it, we were heated. It was a very heated argument. I don't remember what all we were yelling about because it was probably petty bullshit because we're in college. Um, and I'm walking out and he blurts out loud like, you know, um, sorry for this is going to get a little graphic. At least I didn't shit on someone's dick. Is kind of what he said. And I and he yelled it. I so okay. Everyone knows me. Like the the I say the podcast kind of knows me. Especially I'll give Gary kind of like I don't get angry that often. I don't get mad that often. But when I get mad and when I get angry and when I get upset, um. You hulk out? <laughs> yeah, I'm a. I it's it's bad. Like, I it's one of the things I usually will try to control a, a lot in my emotions because when I get angry or pissed to the point where I am explosive, it's an explosion, and it is it is not pretty. And this was one of those moments that set it off. And I, I came this close to punching the fuck out of him. Like I was right David there David in his David face. Don't like huh? to see him when you're yeah. angry. Don't make David angry. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't. Um but uh No, yeah. it's not a big deal. You just carry a tranquilizer gun with you. You know, <laughs> when she's about to rage out, you just, you know, knock her down and <laughs> <laughs> So and yeah, but that was one of these moments where to me like that where you're talking about that vault was broken. Several times. Um, mm. And that, you know, yes, this was a you know random casual counter. And yes, we were young and dumb in college and whatever. But it's very, to me, it's vault. This vault is very important. It's one of the bigger foundations for me in regards to trust. Like, if I can't trust you to keep what we're doing or talking about to yourself mm-hmm. speaking generally then i don't i don't i don't think i can trust you and, well it, yeah. sorry dan no 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 that's that's it i mean i one of the things that was said around me near me something i observed a long time ago that really kind of hit a certain nerve was <clears throat> there's no such thing as a secret if more than one person knows it true so if if you share anything in confidence with only one other person, you are putting a huge amount of like trust and faith in the other individual that they are going to keep it private between the two of you. But it is technically not a secret because it is now known to another person. Mm-hmm. And I always think about that, you know, when things come up and, you know, people do break confidence and they, you know, act a certain way or behave a certain way. And, and, and you're like, uh... I thought that was between us, but that's part of the dynamics of working and dealing with other people and being in relationships. Like I have said sometimes to folks, like you think you know your spouse or your partner, but you actually don't. Mm -hmm. Like even if you've been together 30 years, you don't. Like you're not in their head. Like you, you know, you know what they share with you, what they present to you, what they give you, but you're not actually, you know inside of them to know the actual experience so it's always skewed like what you think of other individuals in terms of like trust and reliability and mm-hmm. and those kind of things and yeah the vault is is a big deal in that you create a space that contains things and the plan is that it does not go anywhere mm-hmm. but right. that's not always necessarily the case yeah like damon's example so yeah. Yeah, and the one um uh the one example that uh, Brene uses that I just love um because I have found this to be true in a few friendships is um that sometimes our relationships our friendships are based on our common 
like dislike of somebody else. Um, and what she mm. refers to that is common enemy intimacy. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, like when, when she said that, I was like, yeah, like <laughs> there are certain people where we, we became friends because of some drama, right? Something that was happening with somebody else. Yeah. Um, mm. So like our <laughs> entire friendship was based on our common dislike of somebody else. Like, fuck that bitch. Fuck that bitch over there. Oh, you don't like her theater? Let's go talk and kiki about her. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. that is that. Well, it, I mean, that kind of unfortunately reaffirms the, the adage, misery loves company. Um, you know, that people are in, uh, uh, I guess I'm going to say a negative mindset. Um, you know, they're upset, they're angry, they're mad, they're sad, they're fearful, they're whatever, you know, and so they, they collectively, you know, kind of gravitate towards each other. I don't recall hearing that before, and I find it really interesting because I think when I was younger, I probably would have been much more prone to that, um, that, that what is it, CEI, common enemy intimacy? Um, yeah. But as I get older, I guess, you know, it's funny. Uh, I've been talking with my best friend about, like, you know, experience and time and how another friend of mine had made reference that they have a theory or a perspective, which I thought was interesting, which is that we suspend time of regarding the age of another person that we know because it kind of gets anchored to when we met them. Mm-hmm. And even mm. though we've known each other for, a, a, you know, X amount of time, like it's difficult to gauge the space of time because like we're not paying attention to time as it's passing. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So like, it's this discussion. It's like, if you met somebody and they were 25 and they're now 33, do you really see them as 33 or do you still see them like in this concept of when you met them? No. Um, I've had that. I feel that so much and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to own it. It has a lot to do with like my, my little second cousins like um i i saw i knew when they were born i saw when they were born when i saw but you know like i remember them as babies <laughs> y'all you weren't in the room you weren't no, in the, the room, room when they yeah. came out of the body? yeah like... no no but like <laughs> and they will always be like babies and young but no honey like some of them are in their 30s now like you got to get <laughs> over that <laughs> like cuz cuz mm-hmm. some again some of them were born when you were like nine, 10 years old. Like you have to realize that these are not, they're not teenagers either. Like that's the big one. Like these are, these are people who are grown right. up, got healthy relationships, jobs, lives, kids of their own. Like it's the concept is, is so odd to me, but it, it it's right. Cause it's reality. They've, they've grown up. <laughs> right. And so you have this this span of time in terms of the relationship, but you have a little bit you have some difficulty engaging mm-hmm. perhaps the length of time, the quantity, you know, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um and so in terms of like relationships and where you see things and your connections to others, like when I was younger, I definitely would have probably been much more prone to establish like this common enemy intimacy. Now that I'm older, I'm like I don't have time for that. Like, and I'm not saying that that CEI is like necessarily a younger age item. Like, I'm not trying to label it that way. But I think if you are an individual who um, does make a, a point in your life to continue like educating yourself and wanting to be a better person, I guess is probably the best way to phrase it. Like that you will see the shift in your own life that they're like, as Damon, you were kind of mentioning earlier, like, you know, about the drama. It's like, I don't, I don't have time for that. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, there is, there's, there's drama in different phases of your life. I mean, there's like drama when you're like just becoming a teenager and you're hormonal. That drama mama is so different than like when you're in your twenties, when you're in your forties, like, Mm-hmm. <laughs> your life experiences everything is very different and how you relate to people you know i think is a, is a measurement of that so i think for some i won't i don't want to say for all but i think for some as you as you age and mature perhaps there's like a wisdom through experience that you're like i i don't have time to make connections with people who uh i have so little in common with 
Mm-hmm. Now, that isn't to say that you shouldn't, like, you know, establish connections or relationships with people that aren't, you know, twins of you. You know, that's what makes the, the world a beautiful place to experience. You know, Ed and I are not 100 percent identical. You know, there go. We can be friends with each other, but we're not also just established on, you know, the hate of one specific person. So I yeah. think that that's a measurement of like, you know, I guess a good relationship is that we're not, you know, both just commiserating over the, you know, disgruntlement of one individual mm. or a population, yeah. I guess. Mm. Yeah. So, um, and I think that's a good, like, kind of transition to the next term. So, like, integrity. So, integrity is kind of, you know, um, pre- like, is the idea of like um, having values, um, but not just having them, um, but like practicing them. Um, mm. So like, you know, kind of standing on your values, kind of like what I like to uh, tell some of my clients, but you know, she, uh, so Brene kind of talks about that. She sees integrity in three parts. So that is um, choosing courage over comfort, choosing what is right over what is fast, easy, or fun, and that you choose to practice your values rather than simply professing them. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's hard. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I know that for me, um, this kind of reminds me a lot of the first time that I took a sociology class. And my professor, uh, Dr. Kristen Williams, talk to us about um, being an advocate, right? Mm-hmm. And like, and being an ally and what that meant. Um, Cause we were talking about, I remember we were talking about the concept of colorblindness and it wasn't until that point that I was, I, I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. Right. And when she talked to us about that, I was like, Oh, fuck. <laughs> Right. Like uh, that was a really big life defining moment. But then she also talked about the fact that like you in order to be an ally, you need to not just say that you're an ally. You have to practice what Mm -hmm. you're preaching. And like and that was you really have to to evaluate the the things that you are consuming um, and see if it's really matching up with your values. So for me, I have a really hard time with any kind of humor that is um denigrative that's um any kind of uh like racism homophobia um i have a really hard time with 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 language right um because that that just doesn't match up with my values at all um Mm -hmm. and and that could be really hard because i think i've mentioned before i've had Recently, um, I've had to kind of set boundaries with a friend of mine um, who was using homophobic language. Mm. Um, and I was like, I, I can't have that, <laughs> you know, um, like this is inappropriate. Um, and, and when you do those things, it's really courageous. Um, <laughs> and yeah, um, and especially in the climate that we're in right now, uh, you know, we have to make – and. Perfect example. So the, you know, not to bring RuPaul into here, but I have a huge problem with roasts. Um, mm. I, you know, I, I don't think that they are, um, I, like, I can't say that my integrity is really, I'm standing on my integrity when I am laughing at, at mm. roasts. Um, Cause you know, it's kind of like you are, um, uh, you are, it doesn't matter how that package is wrapped. Um, there's still shit inside of it. Mm-hmm. I think I know what you're talking about. And I see Gary's face just as I'm kind of saying it. Sorry, I see I see the face dirty, dear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I understand. Um, from a comedy perspective i know what the roasts are about they're kind of meant to be tongue-in-cheek not tongue-in-cheek very much like a a we're making fun of you but you're along for the ride so 
you understand what's going on. Like that's kind of what the roast is. But from what I'm getting from you, Ed, that's still like, cause it's still like kind of, you know, denigrating. It's still kind of humiliating. You know, there's people pointing out flaws in a sense for the sake of humor. And while again, everyone's kind of along for the ride and usually for the most part, like everyone's okay with it. I will say that those are usually like professional comedians and, and, and actors and what have you that normally know how to like get the jab in nicely. That sounds, that doesn't sound fair, but you know what I mean? Like kind of like get that in without like, where, where it's you know, definitely humoristic that. Exactly. Insulting. In yeah. Whereas, when you go to RuPaul and you do the RuPaul roast and stuff like that, you kind of get may I mean, the Queens usually, while they are usually performing characters, they're not necessarily actors and some are definitely not comedians. Um, so they don't really know how to do the jokes. Well, and yes, you can bring in a, a co comedian to kind of come in and coach and whatever, but at the end of the day, like that's maybe two hours or whatever of a life li lifetime of doing this kind of potential comedy. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna it's not something that you just like absorb very quickly and then like turn around and then make it possible, make it doable. That's where we got right. what we got. Like let's 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 put the let's like throw the cards out there. This most recent roast, y'all, on RuPaul. I know Jeff hasn't seen it, but the 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 roast on this most recent episode, like, um, ah, mm, uh, there was some, there was some, there were some things said that were that were not really funny, and were like essentially harmful and hurtful, yeah. um, and um. That's where I think where I get where you're coming from, Ed, is where like, oh, shit, like, like, these could be really bad things. Um, another perfect example, and yes, it's a TV, it's a cartoon, but whatever, like, there's a Family Guy episode where Peter Griffin wants to be roasted because he sees like the late night, you know, if you remember, like the commercial for the late night roast and all that shit in there, like the Dean Martin, whatever kind of bullshit. Mm -hmm. And he goes like, I want to be roasted and everyone kind of gets up there and plays him <laughs> alive it's it's really like if you listen to the episode and you're not like you know it's a cartoon so you kind of laugh along but like if this was like real life if this was a real person like holy shit like this is this is mm. harsh this is hard like wow 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 yeah and again it's it's funny because it's a, car a cartoon and it's comedy, whatever. But at the end of the day, like things that were said were could potentially be harmful and hurtful. Well, right. And so, like, to to talk about the roast, like, idea the to like continue on this. But I think the idea is that there is a consent that everyone participating understands that the point is to take, as the British say, to take the piss out of somebody, like to. Have a have a humorous dose of reality about the individual, but mm. there is a, a like I agree with you, Damon, that there is definitively like a craftsmanship, a skill to mm -hmm. comedy just in general, and that there are all these different flavors of comedy. So yes, like the concept of a roast is not necessarily um, the most agreeable. As a person who has been roasted in their lifetime, like we did it as a part of the event years ago, and the biggest lesson I got from it was that what some of the feedback we got that year was, I don't understand why this roast took place. I don't know who this person is, meaning me and why it was funny. Like they didn't see it as a form of entertainment. They saw it as like, like sort of like behind the curtain inside a certain circle and like possibly maybe mean. And like, nobody quite said that, but I could see where they would be like, this isn't relevant to me. And I had to tell like the, the organizing committee, like, where we misstepped is we presumed everybody would be in on the joke, like that everybody has the same connection with me. And that's not true. Some people were brand new to the event. They'd never seen me before. So they had zero clue as to who I am as an event organizer, let alone this panel of all my friends who uh -huh. are 
really giving it to me, <clears throat> you know, in a comedy style. <laughs> like they just didn't understand why this was like a music because oh, yeah. they because they couldn't relate. And the reality is what what was warped about it the lesson i took away is like boy we really like saw me as a celebrity when in fact i'm a nobody like <laughs> like we were taking the concept of a comedy roast which usually works with celebrity because they're so well known mm -hmm. so that's why people want to watch because they have some connection with the individual but when you don't you're like why do i care about this who, who like, that right like like Okay, whatever. And I mean, and, and so, like, you know, I, I knew going into it, I knew none of what was going to be said, uh, but I trusted because I was told who the panel was going to be made up of. Well, mm -hmm. mostly until right beforehand. Um, there was <laughs> some surprise guests, which was fine. <laughs> um, but the reality is, you know, that we we did it and like I rolled with it and had fun, you know, and, and it was good. Um, but I agreed to that. So mm -hmm. I felt that like everybody that was up there, I had a, a good relationship with. And I knew no matter what was said, I know them at the core of who they are pretty much. I would say 90, 95 percent of them that like it's going to be poking fun at me from a place of love. So to me, there's an there's an integrity in that. Like I'm choosing to be courageous in this moment, like with them and vice versa, because how often do you get to do this kind of a thing where you can be kind of raw and open with another person okay. and get funny at the same time? Um, you know, and some people did, you know, most of them did after you say, well, but that, that point being, you know, it, it isn't to say, you know, I'm not trying to debate, you know, Ed's point that like, it's not everybody's cup of tea. And True. like, that's a key piece of, you know, recognizing that not everyone yeah. feels the same way about something. Um, and there was something I was going to say earlier. Oh, so the thing about integrity, when we were talking about like um, choosing what is right over what is fun, fast, easy, um, putting into practice your values. To me, this relates back to accountability, because one of the things that I've learned in the past couple of years is that when we talk about apologizing, that saying I'm sorry is not an action like it's just making a statement and that it's been shown again and again, like the way that you make amends and apologize for something is to change the behavior that brought about why the apology was needed in the first place. So mm -hmm. if you affronted somebody, if you spoke ill of them, if you, you know, uh, lost confidence with them, whatever the case may be, that your behavior changes so that the individual can see that you are, you know, trustworthy, reliable, accountable you know, and that you are attempting to, I guess, rebuild the integrity bank, you know, with that in that relationship with that person or those people. But that <clears throat> takes time. And some things, understandably, are not uh, mendable or, mm -hmm. you know, like there's just a nope. Sorry. So here is an, an example from pop culture reference. So hello, future listeners and watchers. This won't make any sense. Um, recently in the news, I don't remember the gentleman's name. It's not important at this moment. So uh, there's a big hubbub in the LGBTQIA community, mostly MSMs, because a celebrity, I'm using air quotes, mm. who was on The Bachelor uh -huh. and said to be a virgin <clears throat> had picked the woman that was going to be his girlfriend slash fiance. And <clears throat> he recently came out. Now the coming out is not the issue. What a lot of people I've known on social media are focusing on is, yeah, but his behavior before coming out is almost irrehensible because he apparently was stalking and mm -hmm. tracking the woman that he had selected, like wasn't kind of invading her privacy, like didn't have trust mm -hmm. with her. And that's what people are pointing out. They're like, like, so it's interesting because I think there's certain populations within the MSM community that are like, oh, OK, like so we have had a gay bachelor, quote unquote. They just weren't out at the time or hadn't like come to that, which is very judgmental. And on the other side, there are some people who are really like, I don't care. This behavior is inexcusable. Like they don't get a pass. Mm hmm. And notably, people are pointing out they're like, oh, but this person automatically apparently has a deal with Netflix. And yet they did this. Yeah. Like, so they're yeah. kind of calling yeah, yeah. into question in a public way, like, where is the integrity of Netflix, of this person, like, that they, that all of this is going on, 
sure. like sure, that sure. yet this behavior happened in the past. And we've kind of talked about this before, like when we talked about um, what was it, pedestal to cancel in that episode where we like talked about how like there are people that we kind of we raise up like, you know, not in a uh deity way but we look towards them because they are successful they you know help mm-hmm. we think that we connect with them and then they do some you know they have some behavior some action and you're kind of like whoa, whoa 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 no 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 time out no sorry sis like i'm not i'm not game with that yeah and i think that really <clears throat> changes the landscape and then the reason i think that integrity and accountability are so tied into each other is because like once you've faltered or have lost integrity i think people see you as just like not really accountable mm-hmm. you know and mm-hmm. all of it like reliable you know and all that jazz yeah, so, yeah. I and see, i you know, think that I also see. like the 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 one um podcast that we had an authenticity right like that's kind of part of that that like you know um when something like that happens right like what then what are you going to do right like you know what actions are you going to take how are you going to acknowledge this right and then you know, like kind of like the whole Jenna Marbles thing, like recognizing that like, hey, you know what, I've done some problematic stuff in my past. And like, this is what I'm doing in order to own it. But like, you know, typically the response is from some people that like, that's not enough. Well, and that's an interesting um, example that you bring up. And so for folks that don't know, um, Jenna Marbles uh, was an original YouTube uh, celebrity, I guess I don't like using that word, but sure. um was, you know, a collaborator creator on the YouTube platform for many years. And I actually ended up like getting introduced to her through some folks that I know and followed her for years. And I think it was over a year ago, she made the decision to take down nearly all of her videos and to completely disappear from a social media presence. And part of it was because people came for her and said that she was racist and like some of her behaviors were inappropriate. And she owned that in the past when she was younger, she did some things that she did not at the time see as problematic. What I find interesting is that, you know, she decided that she needed to do a lot of internal self work. So she removed herself from the public limelight because she's like, I need to work on me. Like, and she decided to not make that work a like public viewing which is where a lot of people had problems because they were like, yeah, but you were so open with the rest of your life. Like, mm-hmm. why are you suddenly shutting down and disappearing from, from you know, existence, so to speak, in, in the, you know, uh, online medium? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, yeah, but you don't get to make that call. No. Like, they, they as an individual, get, you know, uh, get to make that decision. And yet, like, it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, I've, I've talked about this with some folks, especially in terms of politics. I'm like, there's no winning. Yeah. There's just no winning. Like you can't make everybody satisfied and appease them. You know, you can try, but the reality is there's so many variables in the human existence. It's like, you know, you know, you just you can't pass enough laws or regulations or remove them or, you know, whatever to meet the interests of all the people that you represent. And it's no different, I think, in, in any capacity of what you have, you know, to mm-hmm. to talk about things and to to be that representative. So I thought Jenna was an interesting example and Ed, i think i had sent you this really uh insightful provocative video of this person who yeah. talks about this concept of accountability and what that means and kind of the big question i took away from that video was like when can you say that something is still accountable to a person if it's a past behavior because what I found interesting was like there was some comparisons to other YouTube creators, like content creators, and how they weren't held to the same scrutiny, yet they had also like eight, ten years previous done some things. Mm. And I find that really interesting is like, you know, I think some people are like, yeah, but the passage of time isn't enough to like assuage someone's, you know, issues or or whatever, you know, fine. I understand that, but uh, there does come an interesting perspective of like how how does how does the crowd quote unquote decide that this is okay or not okay or that this is something from the past and it's a it's a big question that really doesn't have an answer I think because we live in a whole new age. It's twenty twenty one. You know how many how many times in our generation, and I say our as collective amongst the four of us, even though there's some age variance, 
Hmm. How many of us have said collaboratively shared it online or whatever, joked with our friends like, "Woo, child, if the Internet had been around when we were in our 20s and teens, like we would be in a lot of trouble. Like, hell yeah, (laughs) yeah, Mm -hmm. because there wasn't a documentation like, you know, whole capturing our life process online as record for who we collectively are as people like we Mm -hmm. (laughs) were. Older, so most of our stuff is only in the past 10 years. So yeah. for me, I got a good 30 some years that like really aren't documented online in a way. Yeah. And, you know, I will admit there were some things at that time that I'm just fine that aren't online. I'm mm-hmm. not ashamed of them. I just don't need people coming for me because that was a piece of my past. You know what I yep. mean? Like, yep, yep, yep. Mm-hmm. So very true. Um, and and I think the the example that you gave before with that, um, you know, contestant of that show um, that I think, you know, some of the reaction that I'm seeing is that why is he getting a pass? Right. Like he's being escorted right into a reality show. Right. Um, he's being like fully welcomed right into mm-hmm. um, with his admission. Yet there are some other celebrities, some of their people who are being very non-apologetic with their queerness um, and they're being like raked across the coals. Mm-hmm. Cough, cough, little, uh, little Nas X. Um, <laughs> and, well, right, because that's, know, that's the comparative cough, that's... Cough, you know, <laughs> well, that's the comparative that's being held up, right? Is like, And I don't think it's a fair comparison. I'll say this because I don't think it's apples to apples, but it is interesting that they're like, okay, so we have two out entertainers, creators, okay? And one of them is notably white, blonde hair. I don't know if they're blue eyed. Like they are an epitome in some ways of like an individual who always has advantages to them. Like I mean, sure. and, and and gets like that easier representation, acceptability, whatever. And the yeah, other person masculinity. Right. And then the other person happens to be queer, outspoken, like some would say in your face in their creativeness is a person of color. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, yet um, even within the, uh, I would say this and probably step out of my circle, like within the black community, being femme as a, Mm -hmm. as a black male is not necessarily acceptable. Like, I mean, there's, there's all these things. And so, yeah, I think it's fair like to at least look at the two and be like, wait a minute, like, why does this person get this opportunity to ascend or whatever? Like, you know, and that yet this other person is being held like mm-hmm. to a different standard. You know? Yeah. Standard. It's very, very interesting. <laughs> oh yeah. So in that, there's a lot of judgment kids um, that comes from not only within the community, from outside of the community as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of leads into our next part. Yeah. So non-judgment. So N for non-judgment. So <laughs> um, nice segue there, Gary. Um, so, uh, so again, so this um, this concept is basic, basically like um, I can ask you for what I need, and you can ask me for what you need, and we can talk about it and how we feel without judgment. And you know, on the video, she talks about I can fall apart in front of you, and you can fall apart in front of me. And we're not going to hold judgment for mm-hmm. for the way that you're presenting, which uh, is beautiful. Because I yeah. think that that is um, like you know, I I need you to be my rock when I'm really unstable right now. Exactly. Which right. Yeah. I think it's I think it's important to have individuals that can be your support when when that comes up. Um, you know, that's something that we've seen over the past couple of years, specifically during COVID. Um, I think I saw it a little bit amplified that folks, you know, were more uh, open. I don't know if I want to say authentic, because um, I think, you know, everyone makes the decisions in their own space, like whether they want to be uh, open with other people about what they're going through and that they're having a moment, you know, of um, struggle. I don't know if I it's necessarily always a crisis, but you know, it's a time and place where you're like, this is, this is not a good one for me, but I'm going to, you know, dare to share that with you because I think you are reliable and accountable and you have integrity so that, you know, that's uh, a piece of that. And part of that is because, you know, we're, we're able to put aside, you know, that, that judgment, so to speak, and just accept the person as the individual that they are. Um, 
I was talking with my best friend about this just last night in terms of like generationally where things are at. I'll be curious to see where we go in another 10 years because there's a lot of this talk about a younger generation and how, you know, they're different. Well, no shit. They're different. Every generation's different. Like, come on, Mm -hmm. like, you know, let's, let's start with that as an, as like a common acceptance. And then we can start talking about these, like, these you know new belief systems and i'm like i don't know if i call them new belief systems i think it's just a natural evolution you know that perhaps they don't feel because of the lessons of the past generations that no they don't have to get married they don't have to have kids they don't have to own a house they you know don't have to ascribe to a binary you know labeling system as a concept Mm -hmm. everything's always been on the table i think we're just evolving especially in the United States as a country to be like, Oh, not everybody has to conform quote unquote. Do you know what I mean? Like we created all of these structures, these, these concepts, these social mores, right. That like, you know, women present themselves a certain way. They dress a certain way. They have Mm -hmm. these roles in the home, you know, or in the workplace. And I think generationally all of that's been, you know, changing over time. And what I think we're sort of seeing in terms of like politics and that is really this kind of culture war, Um, And I don't like using that, but I think it's coming back around, you know, this concept about what is, you know, in the best interest of the society or the nation. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, like, like, have we forgotten the lessons of our past? I mean, Mm -hmm. so many people have, but yeah. I'm not going to get on a soapbox. I have a big thing I want to say about that, but I'm just going to (laughs) say (laughs) that. I will... I will say that for me, um, non-judgment, I think, is very, very important in a lot of ways. It's the way to kind of, I know that I can bear my, like you said, I can bear my soul to you. And you're not going to laugh or get angry or upset or worse just because of um, what I'm saying to you or telling you or showing you um and that is that is a very i think a big part of a a, another big part of the trust dynamic is when you i feel like i can do the same like if you were to like come to me and be like oh my god this is what happened you know it's my fault blah 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 blah. i'm sorry i won't do it again um and then you follow that up with actions which is another part of this thing here this braving portion then yeah, I believe my trust in you would grow. My my belief that you will be honorable to what you say and do. Well, and, and a key dynamic like in a, in a in a relationship, like let's talk about like an intimate relationship, you know, someone that you're uh, dating or you know committing your your life to share with, like non judgment is a huge foundational key and i feel like that that relationship is going to be well established and i presume a happy one like a positive one because you're actually willing to be that open that honest you know that raw in a way because you feel that you're not going to be judged and i don't know ed like if you can speak to this but i feel like a lot of times i hear like when relationships are seeking assistance like in the form of therapy you know counseling from an individual when it comes to intimacy that can be a big underlying issue is is the fear of judgment you know opening up to your partner about let you want to try this thing and you don't know how they feel about that or in the past anytime you've gone near this subject or whatever your partner has expressed like a negative belief system or attitude or or whichever Mm -hmm. and you're like well i don't want to bring up you know anything that remotely is kinky because my partner every time someone's wearing leather or a harness or you know whatever you know you see someone in a pup hood they make some you know nasty sarcastic comment or whatever and so that can Mm -hmm. really be if you know affecting in a relationship that you feel that you are going to be judged by being who you are and i'm not saying that that there's anything wrong with like not uh i guess sharing who you are but i think you have a much uh better relationship experience if you can feel comfortable in that but it's a two-way street you know like you And the other individual or individuals, everyone hopefully is on the same plane as far as that, uh, 
sharing things and therefore, you know, you feel that you're comfortable in that space and not feeling judged for things. Yeah. The, um, I think that speaks to the concept of vulnerability in relationships. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, that is, that is a concept that brings a lot of people into therapy, right? Like I am afraid, I'm scared to ask you to open myself up to you and be brave and ask you for what I need, because I feel like you're going to judge me and reject me. You're going to laugh at me. Right. And that's going to be really hurtful for me. Um, and you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I have to remind people, we have to hold space. Um, like when our when our partner is coming to us and and performing vulnerability in our face, right? Um, that's a perfect opportunity for us to to hold space for them and for their for their vulnerability. And it's not our our role to be really judgmental or react and jump right into action, right? Sometimes we have to just let them feel, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the I think the other thing that this has been really uh, like when I think about non-judgment is the, the topic of grief um, mm. and loss. Uh, and that for me, I think I posted this on uh, my, uh, my Facebook recently, but like, you know, uh, people telling people how they need to grieve, right? Like, you, mm. you know, you just need to get over it or, you know, um, and like, uh, and I think that this is a, um, a huge um, issue that we have in society is that we don't, uh, we, we want people to feel happy. So we want to get people to feel happy as quickly as possible. And any form of sadness, loneliness, grief, anger, right. Is like, don't feel that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Right. Like, let me judge your emotional experience. And, um, and we, you know, then we're just suppressing our emotions and we're not addressing them. And our yeah. role is our job is just to um, sit with people when they're going through these things and be uncomfortable because it's, it's not comfortable. Yeah. Right. I mean, we've, but as a human society, I think over the course of our existence, that has been our go-to is to like eschew the negative and affirm the positive like mm -hmm. to say oh no, no 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 like we don't have time for sadness and misery and yada yada like we need to focus on the positive and like it, it we've really warped and twisted it in modern times via technology and advances because you know what did we spend the 90s and the aughts up to now doing take a pill bitch like you know <laughs> like this will just make you feel better this will address your you know your stuff and now we're finding actually no sometimes it just yeah. makes you an addict like all it did was you know cover up something or it didn't really give you the ability to address your depression your anxiety yeah. your oh your actual mental health state perhaps you have been undiagnosed as an individual that has a condition you know Maybe you're autistic and, you know, that's not really something that can be fixed with medicine. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's problematic to me that we, we kind of see things that way. And I do agree, Ed, that we have a tendency to just go to the, you know, don't feel that way, blah, blah, blah. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm personally feeling shame recently because I realized I spent a good number of my years giving this statement and it was taught to me in a new way that that's not the thing to say to people which was everything happens for a reason as a philosophy mm -hmm. like your misery is a is happened for a reason well mm -hmm. technically on a factual basis absolutely like no shit bitch like it does happen for a reason but to to use it in a philosophy concept to say your misery is to make you a better person that this yeah. was put in your path to challenge you to teach you love to teach you like whatever like Okay. Yeah. That's, <clears throat> that's really like that's pushing on other people your concept and not really like taking a more neutral stance and saying, like, I don't need to tell you how to feel in this moment. 
um, or how mm-hmm. to handle that particular thing. And I think it is a challenge, especially if you're the type of individual like me, like I'm a problem solver. So someone comes to me with something and I want to give them a solution. And so I've learned over the years that I do need to step back. Like, and I need to not immediately jump in and be like, well, did you think about this? And how about that? And like, did you do this thing? Like, it's <laughs> not my role. You know, some people do come to me as like, cause our friendship, like that's one thing they appreciate about me and my personality but also at the same time it's not for me to do that you know sometimes you do you just hold space um and i think that is key in this this idea of non-judgment is sometimes people just want to share their vulnerability and Mm -hmm. that's okay like and that's all you need in that moment and where the challenge lies is to recognize like you don't have to give an answer a solution you don't have to fix yeah whatever is happening in that moment um and that's a whole journey in and of itself like for some people yeah. to, to not be like you know mm-hmm. and, and and you know no offense we've really warped our society um in some ways you know it's like oh are you unhappy like are you crying here have some cookies like have some cake let's go get ice cream like do you want to do this thing i'm sorry that you did bad on that test like let's go do something to like make your bad feelings go away mm-hmm We've seen it. We see it in every single commercial for any like like home you know, self improvement, or dessert ad, or food ad, or something like that. Like you feel like shit here, shove this down your throat and it'll make you feel better. Or put those thoughts away and let's go to Chuck E. Cheese. Like like that's like been the 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 stuff that has been like pushed on like uh, American society, maybe more, I don't know, but like particularly American society is this whole of like give you something or get something and it'll make you feel better. Well, and it's, and it's, and it is pretty twisted, like from the conceptual of like to avoid judgment, we're going to like try to change your emotional state. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. oh, are you feeling bad in this moment? Like, let's go. Let me go buy you something. Mm-hmm. So it's a, like, it's an immediate like gratification. Can, yeah. Like it's a bad immediate gratification gratification kind of loop because it's not getting to the to the root of the issue as to why the person is having a difficult moment. Yeah. Well, you know. and also it's kind of like, oh, you're feeling bad. All right. Well, let's do something so you are more pleasing to me, right? Like mm. I don't, I don't want you to feel sad, right? Because that's uncomfortable <laughs> for me, right? So <laughs> we're gonna do something so I feel more comfortable. Like, uh, like okay. So when uh, when I had a family member that passed away a couple years ago, my friends were like, um, I don't like that you're grieving right now. Can you not do that? <laughs> <laughs> like that was yes. kind of the message I that was kind of the message I got, and I was what? like, "What? Oh, this sucks!" Like, wait, I wait, wait, wait. Was, like people for clarification, Ed. Those weren't the words said to you, were they? I mean, not not really, but okay. But that's it was but that's the, the words, right? Words. right. It wasn't so much the words; it was it was the feelings that were expressed. Like, right, right. I don't, I don't, I don't. I, I like happy Ed. Like, can I have happy Ed? I'm tired of the sad, grievy Ed. I want happy Ed. I'm sorry. Can you it's, like? Right, can, right, can, right. You, can you stop yourself? grieving right now? Yeah. Can, can you just, just stop? Stop. Just stop. <laughs> just, stop. So, just put it's your just, grieving on pause while we're together. Right, exactly. Fuck it's that interesting shit. that. You and then say when it you go way. away, then 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 you can grieve again. That's fine. But. Right. Yeah. Keep it out I of my bubble. Here. When you're when you're here, we don't want any of that. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. I don't uh, want. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. No. No. No authentic you. No, we're not doing that. No, not like, doing I that today. Together. Put that mask on. <laughs> fucking mask on. <laughs> <laughs> you put that on, you bitch. So yes, for, right. like, for those that are like. <laughs> So for those that are just listening or watching the last minute or two, like what we're talking about is like, is that's what's the the subterfuge of the moment. Like this is this underlying thing. Like your discomfort is making me uncomfortable. Like I can't handle that. I need you to change who you are in this moment so that I could be more, you know, uh, in a better space or whatever. And it's interesting. This isn't exactly a, 
a, a mimic of it or, or whatever. It's kind of a parallel. I've been told several times in my lifetime, they're like, you know, when you're drink, you're kind of fun. Uh, and every time someone says that, I go, does that mean I'm not fun when I don't drink? Like, mm-hmm, that doesn't mm-hmm. make me feel good, like, as a feedback piece that, like, you know, I understand that, like, I am probably in some opinions, people's opinions, high strung and, you know, and very particular and, you know, retentive. And that can be annoying because I don't relax enough. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, for me, there's a there's a whole balance perspective. And it's like, yeah, but honey, like you relax because like you can relax because I'm not or you know what I mean? Like I'm the one who's paying attention to the fact that at any moment there might be an emergency. Yes, that probably speaks a lot to like my upbringing, and perhaps there's a lot to dig into that. And no, we don't need to do that right now, Ed. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, it's like you know, if you've kind of developed that, like it, maybe that's rationalization on my part to like you know to affirm why I have these behaviors. But I feel like there's a whole balance to that. You know that that there are people who are more relaxed than others, and the people that are relaxed telling the anxious people or whatever, you know, to to chill out. Like I, well, the message can be appreciated. It's just also sometimes not helpful, you know, because it in a way it does kind of seem judgmental. And again, as we were just saying, which is an interesting thing, maybe for a, another discussion, you know, a different time about how we want people to be the way we want them to be because we don't care for whatever it is that they're presenting, you know? Yes. (laughs) So, um, love all of that. Yeah. That we could turn that into a topic. Um, (laughs) so finally to wrap this, um, uh, up, we have generosity and, um, what this means, this, this isn't like, you know, being free with your money or whatever. This is that, you extend the most generous interpretations possible to the intentions, words, and actions of others. So this means that, like, you know, if something happens, right, that we don't automatically go to the negative, right? We don't think that, oh, my God, they don't love us or, oh, my God, they don't um, they don't care about us anymore, right? That it's like, hey, you know, maybe they forgot. Maybe they, you know, weren't thinking, Um and if it's really weighing on my mind that I can go to them and I can say, hey, listen, um, you know, this happened. Um, you know, I know that you love me, but just know that that kind of hurt. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and that's that's really important. And I think that's something really brave because I don't think a lot of people um, take the time to do take that action. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I I think that um, I feel that we as an American society are really, really struggling with this one. Yeah. Um, And I don't know quite what's happened. Like, it's it's interesting to me because a lot of like right now, it seems there's a lot of reflection back 40 years to the 80s. And what that period was like in American society, politically, economically, like, you know, all these different things and how it really had a stamp or an influence on, you know, people's lives and their experiences. Um, And some say, you know, that it was a very greedy uh, kind of decade and that, you know, people were very self-centered and it was, you know, very materialistic about how you looked and what you had and how you were presented because that spoke of who you were. And I find it interesting because I remember growing up as a child that there was often a um, statement of – and it's funny because I don't hear it much anymore, so – Anyways, like you'll probably recognize like it's what was keeping up with the Joneses, like mm-hmm. was the concept like that you were always trying to ascend or whatever, like to reach like this equivalency with someone who's doing better than you. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that we're, you know, in the 2020s, uh, so what we call it now, I don't know, um, you know, that that there's been this kind of reflection back on previous times in American society. And and I find it interesting because I feel like, have we ever really grown away from that? Like, did we in the nineties and in the aughts move away from this, you know, kind of ego driven self-centered behavior in some ways, I think we did, but now 
I'm not so sure after this past year going into this year. I mean, like, <laughs> I think yes and no. I think part of it is that we have gotten away from it, but we're going back to it, if that makes sense. Um, there's a lot of selfishness in regards to everything that that is being done. And because of that, it's becoming um, it and it's become more prevalent. I think, you know, again, we've talked about, you know, social media and Internet and all that stuff and how it's kind of affected. We can see it a lot more often and a lot quicker than we did before. You know, the the scandal of a politician in a bathroom is very quickly known because someone caught it on a camera are and then posted it on uh, in a video that went onto Twitter and then you know got went viral and now it's all over the place. You mm-hmm. know, there's no escaping that now, uh, which then shakes everyone's belief in you and trust, quote unquote, in that person. Mm-hmm. And we then lose they lose their credibility, which then loses their their you know status um but that could happen if you think about it it could happen to all of us it could happen to anyone in one way shape or form especially now maybe we say something online that we don't know all the facts about or we say something a little off-putting that someone gets offended by and then there's a tirade of comments on that, you know, one little post and all of a sudden, like it blows up into this big, big, big thing that you didn't really think about until and yeah, you can get rid of the evidence and delete it, but someone maybe kept those receipts and took pictures of it and then they spread it out and give it to someone else. And and yeah, we've had we've talked about cancel culture and all that stuff in the past, but you know, there's that what can you do to make it better? Mm-hmm. Part of this, you know, to me, this braving and, and, and is regaining that trust. And part of that's going to be making yourself accountable and, and becoming, owning your statement and making amends and then taking the actions to show that, yeah, I made this comment, but I'm going to do these things to better it, better myself and better, <laughs> you know, the world in the in the as it were. And I and I can see how like that you know, all of that, right? All of those um cultural happenings, right, mm-hmm. can trickle down into our interpersonal relationships. So like, you know, if we have this um very reactionary, very cancel culture um thing that we're seeing, right, in our interpersonal relationships, um, mm-hmm. our intimate relationships we can sometimes adopt those practices. So like, you know, anytime something happens, like, you know, the, somebody does something or somebody says something that we are, you know, kind of hurts us, right? We're, we're already conditioned to like, well, then they're done. They're cut off. Right. Mm-hmm. I have, um, I, you know, I don't, um, I have no time for this. Right. Um, yeah. When that's not, you know, that, you know, I think that this is saying that we need to recognize that like, you know, we grace, right? I think this kind of boils down to grace, right? Allowing people mm-hmm. the the opportunity to fuck up, and um and to know that like that isn't a direct um hit, right? Um on the integrity of your relationship, right? Like mm-hmm. both giving both of you the opportunity to mess up, and that you can have a conversation to say, hey, this happened, and. Um, that really hurt, but I still love you. Right? Yeah. That's fair. And, and I think we, um, yeah, I just think it, we have a long way to go, like collectively to continue on. What I find interesting is that in my lifetime, we've, we've really moved into this whole new self-awareness phase, but like with it come all the struggles of understanding our own actions, our own belief systems, our behaviors and what that means and how it impacts others. And I think that's one of the 
one of the key dynamic issues at play, especially in our politics, is that there, like, to me, it seems very much that there are pretty much two camps. Like, one camp is very ego, like, self centered, like, what's in it for me? And the mm-hmm. other, like, mindset kind of camp is what's in it for all of us? Because what's good for the other is good for me. And, like, you know, kind of that, like, all ships rise, like, collectively together as opposed to, like, you know, I just need to do what's in my best interest. And it, in with that, you know, is that struggle about, you know, trusting other people and everything that comes with it. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that maybe even just applying some of those, um, I think it's like, you know, as far as like trickle down, right? I think this is kind of like a trickle up effect that like we can start with, you know, us and we can start in like groups in the, you know, classrooms, you know, things like that, and teach people about grace, teach people about being generous, right? That like, you know, and we do this in groups, right? If um, if we're in a group and somebody says something that kind of goes against the group boundaries or the group rules, right, that we have the the agreement that we can say, ow, that hurt, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And, but like saying that like, you know, people are going to say things in here that are going to hurt. Right. And that's okay. We just need to acknowledge the fact that hurt was done and that we can grow from that. Right. Um, Because, you know, like uh, the thing that just keeps on coming up is pronouns, you know, like Mm. or, um, you know, uh, or um, like the trans community. Right. Like if, you know, we're having a conversation and we can gently say to somebody that we or, or know that like, hey, listen, you know, I heard you use this word, right? I heard you use this name. Um, you know, they actually go by this name or they use these pronouns, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, but I know that you, um, you know, I know that you mean well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that the other person correct, you know, the other person can recognize, you know, I'm going to fuck up. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to mess up. Um, yeah. You know, thank you. Thank you for talking to me about this. It's, it's, but a lot of people get really, um, I don't want to use the word sensitive, um, but for lack of a better word, um, mm-hmm. a lot of people take that to heart and think that we're <laughs> criticizing them or, yeah. you know, um, so yeah, we do have a lot. <laughs> well, and, and, and I think the key piece like is, you know, um, how close are you to the other individual? And I, and, and really this comes down to everything. Like if you, I think your ability to be compassionate to others is somehow related to your own experiences, like, and how, how you can equate that with other individuals. I cannot understand or imagine what it's like to be a person of color. I just can't like, it's not an, it's not in my realm. Can I understand what it's like to be discriminated against? Yes. Not the same, but, you know, I have some experience that's a little bit relative to that, um, Mm -hmm. but I can't speak to it. And having been on the receiving end of of certain negative things and experiences in my life, I feel it's made me more compassionate. So I'm uh, more amenable to when someone comes to me and says, hey, I don't like it when you say this or this is incorrect. Like, you know, please mm-hmm. don't use this reference. Don't make this, you know, whatever mm-hmm. it is as a, as a feedback, I'm much more open to it. And yet I know other people who are like, I just don't, don't understand this fucking shit about pronouns. What's the big goddamn deal? And it's like, yeah, well, obviously you are not on the receiving end of where this is an issue. Like for you, you know, and it, it just made me wonder, like, I don't think it would go over effectively as an experiment because I have a coworker that this that almost that exact thing came out. And I just I just thought to myself, I'm like, well, what if I misgendered you for the rest of the time that we work together? Like, mm. would that would that help you start to understand? Like what it's like to be an individual on the receiving end of that, you know, mm hmm. Um, I also think context matters. So, like, uh, sometimes I see this done on you know, social media platforms. And, and I'm like, I don't know how helpful it is to, um, uh, you know, if somebody says something wrong or whatever, to put it right in the comments, right? Like sometimes I'm like, hey, how about you take that off into a private chat? Mm-hmm. Right? Like address it that way, because a lot of times people can take that as an attack or getting called out. Um, no matter how right. 
soft you present it, um, it can it can be interpreted as an attack, and that's not a that's not a good that's never helpful. Well, right. There's there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of impact if a, if a person intentionally or unintentionally decides to be a social justice warrior. Like, mm. and and I think that's part of what you're talking about is like you know they come forward and they say something, but they do it in a public way. How it's viewed and interpreted by others is a whole other like gambit. It's like like your intention might be good, but your delivery, you know, is not necessarily yeah. the best in that moment. Cause the reality is like, maybe you didn't mean to put them on blast, mm -hmm. but you did like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you know, and, yeah. and there's something to be said for, you know, having private confidence with a person, you know, and, and having that moment where you can like talk to them about, you know, accountability and mm -hmm. give them the opportunity to not feel like they're on trial. Yeah. Or, or more importantly, that there's a mass of people coming forward, you know, with the same opinion, because that could be overwhelming to an individual. You mm -hmm. know, if someone says something or does something that is, you know, an issue for a population, you know, having all of them and or their friends, their supporters, their families like coming for you. Yeah, like that's a, like could be very problematic. And it's not that everything needs to be behind closed doors or kept private, but like there's, I think there's kind of a, an appropriateness like to the forum where mm -hmm. things are, are handled, you know, in, in a way. And, you know, we, we forget that we lose sight of that, especially when it comes to celebrity. I feel like when someone makes, you know, uh, exhibits a behavior, you know, an action or whatever, and then everybody publicly like has a right to like, you know, grab a torch and light it on fire, mm -hmm. and, you know, storm the castle or whatever. And I'm kind of like, yeah. hold up. Like, yeah, it, you know. Yeah. And I think it's a choice, you know, like we have the choice whether to, to get on that, you know, to pick up our torch or to not and just say, you know what, this isn't the right form. Yeah. Yeah, and that's great, really, and that can be really difficult. <laughs> uh huh. True. Well, yeah. I mean, and we're such we're so quick triggered. I think, like, as a human society, to like jump to conclusions, to you know, move into a certain thing without taking a moment to like, like this is the thing you know that I think we we are lacking just society wise, the ability for perspective, like to take a moment and think to yourself, like. How important is this? Where's this coming from? Like, why do I feel that I need to take this action? And we're all guilty of it. Like, I'm still guilty of it, you know, to this day. You know, it'll it'll be a lifelong pursuit to, like, be more authentically in the moment and think about why I'm behaving the way I am or taking this particular action. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's not necessarily available to people for a whole myriad of reasons. Like, so in my work with the public health department, a ton of stuff in the past year has been about health disparities. Like health disparities have existed forever, but now it's a, it's a focus of a lot of like online training and lectures and it's woven into the, like the fabric of discussions and how, you know, we are not doing right by all of the public. Like mm. that there are pockets of things that need to be addressed, you know, and how, you know, it is understandable. There are certain parts of our population that are not trustworthy at just, let me, sorry, let me rephrase that. What I meant was they don't trust what's mm. presented because of how they've been treated in the past. Well, yeah. yeah, understandable. Like we've got to work on that. We've got to, you know, change behavior in the, for, like as a way to show that we apologize and amend for like the things that have happened before. And it's not going to be easy and it's going to take a long time. And, you know, that, and, you know, this kind of goes to the whole concept, you know, that trust is built off of, you know, a collective of things, not just one thing. So, you know, as you, it's kind of, to me, it's like a foundation of a building, you know, you like, yes, you pour a pad, like a cement pad, let's say is this analogy, but then you also have to build up and like, it takes a whole collection of bricks to be able to build that thing to make it structurally sound to go from there in my analogy. So it's like, you know, while one brick can be problematic or a few bricks can be problematic, like that can be addressed, you know, um, it's not necessarily that the whole thing is a disaster could be, but not necessarily. Yeah. It's, it's more like you have certain things that you need to, to address, you know, if you think of it this way, it's like, you're making a recipe. Well, 
if you use, you know, three year old brown sugar that's been in, you know, your canister all this time, well, you, your baking product might turn out a little differently, you know, could be similar, maybe not the same, mm-hmm. hard to say, you know. So, it, you know, it, the components, the ingredients that make up a thing, I think, can also be a, a key factor into what we produce or what comes uh, out of that particular also, thing. And also when we're generous in our um, in our um, interactions with others, mm-hmm. that also allows other people to be generous with us. Yeah. Right. Agreed. So like if we can if we can recognize that like, hey, you know, I recognize you're going to fuck up sometimes. I'm going to I'm going to allow you that and I'm going to you know, we're going to have that that trust. Right. That like you can call you can let me know when I mess up. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that like you still care about me. Right. And that, like you said, that will allow us to grow as people. Right. Because I think the. What you it, it, kind of generosity to me is really about what you exhibit is what you get. Yeah. Um, is that the golden rule? Yeah. Like do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Am I yes. remembering that? Yeah, right? Kind of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe not the exact words, but close enough. So, yeah, like how you treat others is how you would like to be treated. Like, but there's some, you know, it's a double edged sword yeah. in that moment. You know, it's not it's not a perfect um message so to speak yeah um when it when it comes to that stuff so uh ed did we talk about the marble jar i can't remember yeah, yeah so like um one. so this kind of you know wrapped up and like started like the final notes but like um just the idea that like you know this is a great um acronym and this is a great concept um the you know some some things to consider are that like somebody may be really strong in one area of the of this concept, but they may need work in other areas. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that like we can't that that doesn't mean that it still negatively impacts like our level of trust for somebody. Um, you know, so like I may have like really good boundaries for somebody, but like you know they may not be that great with reliability or accountability, right? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. that means like you know we can kind of grow on that, right? And that's the whole thing with, um, you know, with the work that I do, right? People come into my, my room and they don't really have great accountability skills, but I can give them to them so that they can, um, you know, strengthen those. Um, and the, 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 what, the last point that Brene Brown, uh, gives that I think is really important is that, um, this is great for interpersonal relationship. But it's also really important for intrapersonal relationships, the relationship with ourselves. So um, before we can, uh, you know, examine somebody else or the our relationship marble jars, we also have to uh, recognize our own marble jars. Like, you know, are is it really does it make sense to ask somebody for something that you're not willing to give to yourself? Mm. I love that. Right. Yeah. So like. How can I how can I ask you for boundaries if I'm not willing to set boundaries for myself? Mm-hmm. That's so true. Never, yeah. You know, yeah. How can you ask for accountability for what, someone when you don't hold yourself accountable for your own actions? Thank you. Like, like, um, I think that's one of the big ones. <laughs> you know, you want people to. And we all want that. We want people to like say they're gonna say what they're gonna say and do what they're gonna do, and and you know hold themselves up to that standard. But if you're unreliable in your own life and you're not the one that can be re- you know relied on or help you know or, and don't listen when someone says you know um, you've been late like every time we go out like you're always. 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late, like, you know, so it makes it difficult to make plans with you. And you're like, oh, well, I'll, I'll you know, it's, it's just the way I am. Like, I, I, I have, I take a little time getting ready or blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, that's, that's fine. But if you're not going to change your behavior, then like, I'm going to move on without you. I'm going to go to this movie without you and I'm not going to buy you a ticket. I'm not going to, you know, like we're going to go to this theater and go see the show and we're all going to sit together and you can come, but you might have to get your own ticket. 
you mm-hmm. might be sitting behind us because you know we're going to go in this group and go together but i don't i don't i don't trust you enough to buy this ticket for you and you be able to get there on time right yeah <laughs> I'm thinking about your I'm thinking about your example David because I'm like if I noticed that this is behavior I'd be like I just tell them to be there 30 minutes earlier. Yeah, no. Like, no, no, no. I would I would modify and cope and be like, "Oh, she's always like almost a half hour late." So I'm just going to tell her 30 minutes earlier so that she's on time. Like, you know. Mm-mm. I don't like that. <laughs> like we okay. So I this you know I hate like I know spilling tea like we have a, a member of the chorus who is notorious for being late for things and everyone always laughs and everything's you know sweet and everything else he's gotten better but in the past it was always that was what they would do is like like we're supposed to be there at six you need to be here at five like that was the the, the joke and everyone laughed but like like that shows that you're like, everyone knows that you're not reliable. Mm. So um, yeah, you'll get there eventually, but you know, if you gotta, if, if you, if we need to set separate boundaries and set separate things for you, just so that you might get here on time and might be ready, then no, like the world well, doesn't revolve around you, honey. And you're, right. And you're right, Damon. And I think there's a difference in terms of accountability on that level when it impacts things in a different way. I guess I, I was thinking in terms of like just amongst a group of friends, like to go out or something, I'd be like, I'd intentionally tell you the wrong time just to make you mm. on time. Like, but mm. in terms of what you're talking about, like with the chorus, even though it's a hobby, like it's a volunteer thing, there's still something to be held accountable to it. Um, like professional meetings, trainings, mm. like mm-hmm. – uh, it's interesting because I've noted, like, especially within our organization, when we like have a meeting, there are certain people that are like, it's 10 o'clock, meeting starts now. We're not waiting yeah. two minutes, not waiting three mm-hmm, minutes for mm-hmm. people to like show up or whatever. We're just starting off. And it's not talked about, but I've caught that it like sets the tone of like, we ain't waiting yeah. around for you because you're late. Like, uh-huh. and I'm not saying we have habitually late people. I've just noticed that like it it makes everybody kind of toe the line mm. in terms of like you know they have to be more accountable in terms of their own yeah. time or whatever. Yeah. And I know that personally, like recently, you know, uh, two weeks in a row, there's a meeting that I'm kind of leading, but something happened and it came up and like. Unfortunately, we didn't have the meeting at, at a last minute thing, and I didn't have the opportunity to tell it everybody. And then this past week, I was late to it because, like, I'm managing a multi thing project. Long story. And then, and so someone pulls me aside, and you know, and I'm in a whole different part of the building, not my office. So I'm busy talking to them. Someone comes and seeks me, and they're like, "Are we having this meeting?" And while they're right to call me out in the hallway, like, I said. Yes, we are going to have the meeting. I'm talking to this individual. I'll be there in a moment. Like, mm. I, you know, I got called out sort of in a way, and it was not exactly the most professional. It also wasn't super unprofessional, but like the message was received, you know, <laughs> and I apologized to everybody when I got on the Zoom call. Like, hey, sorry, I'm three minutes late for the meeting. Here's, you know, what happened and why I'm not here, which was relevant to the meeting. It was like, you know, yeah. I put up these work orders to have these things done. Someone was asking me questions, so I was answering them because I was available. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was me checking myself because I wanted to be like, bitch, back the fuck off. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I was not feeling generous with my with my food. Yeah. Okay. When it came yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I think, you know, when it comes to trust, there's a lot of different elements that can go into it. And I think, you know, between the last episode, 595, and this one, um, together, it gives people some good insights as to things to think about when it comes to their relationships um, and not only like trust between themselves and like another person, but also like in a broader scope um, in terms of like community and, and groups in that case. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Ed. And also that, like, 
you're welcome. And I think the other like really important thing is that trust is built in small moments, right? Like that, um, you know, all of these kind of our marble jar, right? Just to remind everybody, isn't these sweeping huge things, right? Sometimes it's that like they called us knowing that we had a bad day. Sometimes it's them asking, um, clarifying something that they were unsure, right? Sometimes mm-hmm. it's, um, you know, letting them know that they recognize that they forgot our birthday, right? Mm. Um, you know, sometimes it's, um, you know, you see them stand up for something that they believe in, mm-hmm. right? Them uh, practicing what they preach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. I, that. Mm-hmm. I think that's the end. Oh. Yay. Anyways, there's plenty of ways to contact us. Let us know what you think about braving. Be brave. I want uh, to see you con- be brave. <laughs> you can ooh, I could go places. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> plenty of ways to contact us. Pop over to our website. Comes out loud.com. Shoot us an email. Comes out loud at gmail.com. Uh, leave us voicemail at 361. See talk. That's 361-265-8255. You follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud in the appropriate place of the URL. You can join our Entourage chat. When you'll get notifications when you go live and have very other sort of discussions that end up coming up. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, at tele- On our Telegram uh, chat at tinyworld.com slash telegram dash col. Find out when we're planning or recording these and what the show titles are, might be at tidyworld.com slash calendar dash col uh you can get various accoutrements we've got a theme today all of these are like our uh, uh v3 logos uh gary has one of our special versions of that uh, on uh, but you can get some of that over at zezzle.com slash cubs out loud uh, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cubs out loud or just send us a little cash at paypal.me slash cubs out loud you can uh, subscribe, rate us uh, over on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, uh, uh, Audible, and uh, Amazon. You can find me anywhere on the internet. It's Box It, Box, Puppy Box, Cub Box, something or other, or Windjum, W-Y-N-D-G-E-M, on Twitch, uh, where I'm actually uh, streaming some of the things that I've been actually playing for the past month and a half obsessively. Hmm. Uh, if you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me at theatercub79 on most bear-related sites or uh, on Facebook. You can find me as pup underscore umber on Twitter. The Twitter is not safe for work. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as gearbear73. Mr. Ed, how would folks get in touch with you? Well, um, you can find me on Facebook uh, for my name, um, but it's Edward AC. Um and everywhere else, you can either find me as Little Cubby, L I L C U B B I E, um, or uh, Twitter at Eddie H. Cook. And um, feel free to visit my website, eactherapy.com. There you go. And with that, uh, say goodnight, everybody. Goodbye. Good night, everybody. Ciao for now. Bye.